My name is Mark Tessier-Leving, uh, and I'm the president of the Rockefeller University. This evening, we're gathered to celebrate the ninth annual presentation of the Perlmeister Greengard Prize, an international award recognizing outstanding women in biomedical science. I'd like to thank you um, all for joining us here tonight. It's a wonderful show, show of support for the prize that Paul Greengard and his wife, Ursula von Reidingsvard, and other generous friends of Rockefeller have helped uh, to establish here at the university. Let me start by providing some background on this important prize. Um, as many of you know, in 2000, Paul Greengard was awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine for his crucial discoveries about the brain's biochemistry. Paul's research is shedding light on the fundamental causes of neurological and psychiatric illnesses, such as Parkinson's disease, <coughs> autism, depression, schizophrenia, and Alzheimer's disease. Paul and Ursula then made the decision uh, to um, uh, donate his monetary share of the Nobel Prize to create the Perlmeister Greengard Prize for outstanding women scientists. It's Paul's passionate belief that women are not being recognized at a level commensurate with their scientific contributions, and he was determined to use his new prominence as a Nobel laureate to address this issue. The prize is named uh, in memory of Paul's mother, Perlmeister Greengard, who died tragically giving birth to him. A number of the university's friends and benefactors were so moved uh, by Paul and Ursula's gesture that they also contributed to the endowment of this prize. By focusing on the accomplishments of women scientists, the prize seeks to increase the likelihood that they will receive just recognition and greater consideration for other major international awards. Now tonight, uh, we're here to honor Dr. Joan Stites, the recipient of the 2012 Perlmeister Greengard Prize. Dr. Stites was chosen by the members of the Scientific Selection Committee. I'm honored to serve on this committee with some very distinguished scientists whose names you can find uh, in your program. I'd also like to acknowledge the Female Association of Clinicians, Educators, and Scientists, known simply as FACES, and the Women in Science Initiative. Each year, these two initiatives co-host a discussion between the Green Guard Prize recipient and women scientists from our tri-institutional community. These discussions have become a cherished annual event, and I thank you for embracing this important award. Now, before I introduce our guest speaker this evening, I'd like to share with you a short film produced by Ursula and Paul's daughter, Ursi von Reidingsvard Grieve. The film features some of the past recipients and speakers, as well as members of our Rockefeller faculty who have shared uh, in the nine-year history of this prize. Please enjoy the film. The reason that uh, we established this prize is because I had observed in my academic career a great deal of uh, discrimination against women. Men and women are interested in different things. So when men and women are completely engaged, fully engaged in science, we will have, we will progress in many different areas. I think the Paul Meister Greengard Prize is a tremendous acknowledgement of the fact that women contribute to the sciences just as much as men do and that the women who've been awarded this have devoted themselves to science and pursued it single-mindedly. Women have the extra problem that we are required to be super women. We, we usually have a home life where we have children that we're juggling uh, and trying to balance uh, the work and science and life equation is difficult. It's very difficult because the time of one's life that one is ideally suited to do one's best early work in science is exactly the time that one wants to be having one's children. Dr. Greengard's establishing this prize in honor of his mother was, I think, inspired. The story is a remarkable one. Professor Paul Greengard. This is a fantastically emotional moment. It was a standing ovation for Paul. It was enormously popular. We were all so happy that he was honored in that way. And then he took the microphone and announced this amazing gesture. Paul Greengard gave his Nobel Prize money and devoted it to an award that he set up on behalf of his mother and of all women in science. It was a big shock to see how these attitudes that women were inferior went on decade after decade. I think it's very touching that Paul uh, named this prize after his mother as well as himself. That he still thought of his mother as something valuable that should be 
recognized and remembered. He said that she had been so abstract, I suppose because there was no visual representation, no picture of her, that uh, it was, she was an abstract concept. And he wanted to make this person a sort of concrete and real. To be able to recognize and to sort of give her a tribute, but a tribute also to, to all women of the world, I think it's a fantastic situation. We'll remember always who she is, we'll know who she is, we'll tell her story, we'll tell our students about her, the women and the men. It's important. Sometimes we're so driven we forget how important these family connections are to us as human beings. I think Rockefeller is one of the few institutions that has these programs explicitly meant to benefit and honor women in science. This prize, I think, is giving the Nobel Prize Committee ideas about who should they be thinking about next year. That myopia about, oh, there's no good women, goes away when you look at the list of winners from the Pearlmester Greenberg Prize. And in the spirit of this beautiful film, I should mention that two of the 2008 Green Guard Prize recipients, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Blackburn and Carol Greider, were awarded the Nobel Prize uh, in Physiology or Medicine in 2009. So uh, let me now uh, turn to Sylvia Earle, our guest speaker this evening. Uh, Dr. Earle is a champion of the world's oceans, which she calls uh, the blue heart of the planet. For more than 50 years, she has explored the depths of the world's large bodies of water and sought to educate the public about the vital role that the oceans play in human survival. Dr. Earle has logged more than 7,000 hours underwater and led more than 100 expeditions throughout the world. In 1970, she was part of the famed Tektite Project, in which she spent two weeks with a group of four other women researchers living and working in an underwater laboratory. She set a record in 1979 when she was the first person to walk in a pressurized diving suit on the floor of the Pacific Ocean at a depth of 1,250 feet. Dr. Earle has made many other record-breaking dives as technological advancements uh, in submersibles have allowed her to attempt deeper and deeper descents. Dr. Earle is former chief scientist of the National Oceanogra uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. She founded the Sylvia Earle Alliance, Mission Blue, and Deep Ocean Exploration and Research, three organizations to study biodiversity in the oceans and advocate for its preservation. She's also partnered more recently with Google to map the oceans in the same way the continents have been mapped, giving us a more complete view of the geography of the planet. Dr. Earle was named Time Magazine's first Hero for the Planet and a 2009 TED Prize winner. Today, she's a National Geographic Explorer in Residence. The author of several books herself, Dr. Earle is also, uh, was also given the distinct honor this year of being the subject of a children's book entitled Life in the Ocean, the Story of Oceanographer Sylvia Earle. With its vivid illustrations and positive message, this book can inspire future explorers. We're grateful that Dr. Earle has taken time out of her very busy schedule to be with us this evening. Please join me in welcoming oceanographer, conservationist, author, and aquanaut, Sylvia Earle to the stage. Well, thank you, Dr. Tessier Levine, for this welcome at Rockefeller University. My first time on this campus, I trust not the last. <laughs> I certainly want to thank the members of the Pearl Meister Green Guard Prize Selection Committee for inviting me to be a part of this celebration. And Joan Stites, where are you? Yeah, right in the front. <laughs> we met in the elevator earlier this evening. <laughs> I want to congratulate you for your important work, and I certainly look forward to hearing more this evening about your accomplishments. And finally, I want to commend Ursula von Reidenbard and Paul Greengard for establishing this prize. What a wonderful tribute to your mother for women scientists for the continuity of life. It's my honor this evening to be here and especially to salute Dr. Stites, who 
dives deeply into the inner workings of cells using technologies that were simply unimaginable a century ago. Tonight, I want to share with you some of the joy I have had of diving into the ocean and reflect on what is being discovered that relates to the health of the planet and that, of course, to the health of humans and for life on Earth generally. And I want to begin by sharing a little video clip about some exploration that took place using submersibles, a submersible, a very special one, that was used about the same year that Dr. Paul Greengard arrived on the planet. This was about 80 years ago. So could we have that first video clip, please? Imagine what it was like in the early 1930s, going to the waters not too far from where we are here, off the coast of Bermuda, a place well known to our fellow mammals, the humpback whales, as well as to legions of creatures that occupy the ocean from the surface to the greatest depths. Here, Bibi and his engineer associate, William Barton, clambering into this hollow sphere that was forged not far from here in New York State and then lowered into the depths as much as half a mile beneath the surface. They were the first humans to actually witness and verify that the ocean is alive, filled with life. We now know more than was known at the time about the great diversity of life in the ocean, the census of marine life. Jesse Osabel, who's with us in the audience tonight, had much to do with pioneering this as just inventory of who shares life on Earth with us. We think of the diversity of life in rainforests as being wonderful, and it is, but the life in the ocean, nearly all of the major divisions of life, the animal life, the bacteria, the plants, the microbes that have ever lived on Earth, whose major divisions, by and large, are still out there in the ocean. It's like diving into the history of life on Earth when you go beneath the surface and on into the depths of the sea. And to witness at first hand one of the most common forms of communication on Earth. It's not cell phones. It's bioluminescence. On the order of 90% of the creatures that live in the deep sea have some form of making their own living light. Up until the time that Bibi and Barton made their historic journey into the depths, well, journeys, there were several times when they plunged into the Sargasso Sea, this place where there's a floating golden forest. It's like a rainforest, but it's even wetter than rainforests. With a virtual zoo of creatures. Some of them live only in this floating forest. Christopher Columbus knew about this floating forest, and other sailors, those who go from New York to Bermuda, encounter sometimes these vast forests that float in the open sea. But getting to know who lives there and the significance of these floating systems to the carbon cycle, to the nitrogen cycle, to the oxygen cycle, to the cycle of life itself. These are things that we're beginning now, decades later, to see how all of these things fit together and how we are a part of the living systems that make up most of the planet out there in the ocean. I'd like to switch now to some Slides, images, it will take us deeper and wider. We're now in the deep, deep sea, where it's all least dark, except for bioluminescence, of course. This is the time that we can begin to celebrate the access that we have, not just to the skies above that have given us that perspective back on ourselves, but into the depths below. Because of the new technologies that have come along, since the era of William Beebe and Otis Barton, we have learned more about the ocean than during all preceding human history. 
things that were not known even when I was a child, or when Rachel Carson wrote The Sea Around Us in 1951, the existence of the mountain chains that run down the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans, of hydrothermal vents, of the fact that the continents move around. I was taught in my first class of oceanography to scoff at the very idea that the continents can move and shift. But now we know. Now we have the means to get out and see calamari swimming in something other than lemon slices and butter, <laughs> to get to see them actually in their own realm, to enjoy the splendor of life on Earth that was truly inaccessible to humankind, except on one-way trips into the ocean. Those are easy. It's round trips, going down and coming back, that really count. Getting to know something about this great spectacle, this spectrum of life in the sea, from sponges to the jellies, this range of creatures that have no counterpart, or very few in some cases, on terrestrial or freshwater environments. It's getting into the sea that has just transformed our understanding of the ocean. And now, of course, with other means that we have with underwater robots and autonomous vehicles that can swim on their own. But there is nothing like taking yourself into the ocean and actually being face to face with creatures that are easy to find in the supermarket. <laughs> but there's no substitute for the real thing swimming in the ocean itself. One thing that I discovered by actually being in the ocean as a diver, living underwater from time to time, is getting to see the fish have faces, like cats and dogs and people, horses and things. Everyone is an individual, each with its own DNA recipe, with its own RNA, with its own fingerprint that sets every grouper apart from every other one. They have different attitudes, too. Some are curious, like this one. Wants to know, what is this primate coming down into its backyard? It's just such a glorious experience. My mother waited until she was 81 before taking the plunge and getting to see the ocean from the inside out. And she scolded me after that. Why didn't you get me into the ocean sooner? And if she were here tonight, she'd say, if you're 81, don't wait any longer. <laughs> it's there to be done. As long as you breathe, you can dive. At least that's what I tell people when they ask me, do you still dive? <laughs> as long as I breathe, I expect to be taking the plunge, getting to see these creatures on their own terms, using the ocean as a laboratory, getting to see those creatures on their own terms, face to face, <laughs> nose to nose. Even the biggest fish in the sea, relatively unknown until quite recently. Now, we're getting to understand that the spots on every great whale shark is different from the spots on any other whale shark. They behave differently. It should not come as a big surprise when you look around, humans, everyone, through all of history, it has been a unique individual. Why should it be different from other forms of life? And yet, somehow, it's taken until fairly recent times for that concept to get across, that they're all separate individuals. Every leatherback sea turtle, <laughs> getting to see them and their other sea turtle relatives. Now, like turtles, our fellow mammals, seals, and whales can only dive as deep and as long as they can hold their breath. For sperm whales, that can be as much as a mile for as long as an hour. For humans, it's not quite that deep and certainly not that long, unless you go with equipment such as this, the underwater laboratory. Dozens have been developed since I was a child, mostly developed since the 1970s. The first time I had a chance to live underwater was for two weeks in 1970, most recently last July, when I spent a week in Aquarius down in the Florida Keys. This was only at 20 meters, although some systems have enabled people to go and stay as much as 
as 500 meters and stay for weeks at a time. But like last summer with some of my fellow scientists, we had a chance to not just stay inside where there were microscopes and other equipment, but also there were heavy duty kinds of equipment placed on the reef outside where we could go and explore and be entertainment for the fish who came and peered in the windows. This is the door in, in the floor that enabled us to swim in and out freely day and night to go out and meet and visit with the fish and look at the instruments wired to our home base and to see the creatures that had actually adapted our underwater laboratory as their home. I revel in the new technologies that now enable us to have access to the sea like astronauts who can go up in the sky. Think of what we would not know but for the development of telescopes, of microscopes, of submarines that enable us to see better the subjects that we are interested in. I particularly like this and other variations on the theme of little submarines that are so simple to drive that even a scientist can do it. <laughs> I am living proof. <laughs> you can make it a team sport if you wish. Take several scientists down at once or even have a driver if you wish. Just a few weeks ago I visited the deepest diving scientific submersible now in existence. No, it's not in Europe or in this country or Canada, it's in China. China has taken the lead in terms of the deepest diving submersible dedicated to science that has ever been built, 7,000 meters. And we do have systems, the Alvin has been a leader since the 1960s, taking hundreds of scientists into the sea to explore the ocean from the inside out. I was allowed to climb inside of the Sea Dragon, as they call this new vehicle, and dream about what it must be like to go as deep in the sea as airplanes fly high in the sky. Well, actually there's one system that goes as high as I flew this morning from India to get here. I arrived about 4 a.m. at the airport from New Delhi. India, too, is building a submersible dedicated for science to go to 6,000 meters. But it was Jim Cameron, an entrepreneur, a scientist, an artist, a movie director, a Canadian who spends much of his time in the United States when he's not traveling around, to invest his time, his talent, his own resources over eight years to build a system that can go to the deepest part of the ocean, seven miles down, 11,000 meters, truly as high in the, deep in the ocean as aircraft tend to fly in the sky. Last March, he successfully went for the second time in history to the deepest place. Previously, 1960, two men made that trip. They only went for 20 minutes. He actually stayed for two and a half hours, exploring the depths, confirming that life exists, yes, high in the sky, with spiders that fly on webs, high in the stratosphere, with insects, with birds, bats, and in the ocean, the plankton in the sea that exists from the surface to the greatest depths. And he witnessed this and brought back information, just as our honoree this evening dives deeply into cells and brings back the mysteries and reports to us what she sees and shares that information. The combination of the human intellect with the technologies that we have mastered and mustered to the case to bring new insights into where are we in the greater scheme of things. As Ed Wilson has expressed in his most recent book about the social conquest of Earth, who are we? Where have we come from? And where are we going? The big questions. Looking at it from the inner workings of the cell to the deep, wide workings of the planet itself. That's the opportunity that we now have that we could not have before this point in time. It's a magic time. I call it the sweet spot in, his, in history because before we could not know the things that are now within our reach. Another 50 years, 
even another 10 years, may be too late for us to act on some of the knowledge now within our grasp, knowing the value of the existence of life, of chemosynthesis in the deep sea that was not known half a century ago. Now, some interests are focusing on mining the deep sea before we even answer questions about the role of the archaea, those deep dwelling microbes that have mastered chemosynthesis, not using light to fix energy. Looking at the diversity of life in the deep sea, most of it still to be explored. We've only looked at perhaps 5% of the ocean. That means we're entering the greatest era of exploration, not just of the sea, but in every dimension of science. We're opening doors all the time that lead to more doors that need to be opened. Here we are at a point in time, maybe, <laughs> in the deep sea, or it will come forth. Have I pushed the wrong button? Let's see. Let's try this. We're back in the deep sea. <laughs> And try it again. Ah, must be <laughs> it was working five minutes ago. Anyway, there we go. Onward to this. Just a brief look at what we can do that those mighty minds of centuries ago could not they didn't know enough to even dream of what we now can reflect upon about the deep history of our species longer than a hundred thousand years ago there were humans on earth but over the last hundred thousand years it's been tough going when you consider the ups and downs of temperature of climate of ice age fluctuations when greater ice lesser ice up and down circumstances that up until ten thousand years ago have been pretty rocky in terms of a planet that was in our favor, we were here as humans, but only in the last 10,000 years have things sort of settled down to a state that has enabled our prosperity to really take off in a way that we now tend to take for granted. And we've been so complacent about a planet that works in our favor that we have been lax, we've been complacent, we have not thought about the conscious effort that we need to take care of the systems that give us the benefits that we now are seeing at risk. The oxygen in the atmosphere, we shouldn't take it as a given. It took all preceding history to get us to the point that we now really enjoy and do tend to take for granted. The growing human pressures, there are now, hmm, you know, seven billion of us. When I arrived on the planet, about two billion. I and many of you in this audience have seen this, well, all of us have seen this unprecedented apparent prosperity that has come at a cost that we are now, for the first time, being able to put in perspective, to understand there are limits to how much we can extract from the natural systems that give us everything. The great gift that came as a consequence of burning the ancient fuels We've had access to the skies above and certainly to the depths below. Perhaps the greatest gift that has been derived from the burning of fossil fuels over the past century, especially the last half century, and the pace is picking up on coal, oil, gas, is we need to change our ways. The greatest gift is knowledge. The system of being able to communicate around the world driven by our access to energy that makes this possible to satellites in the sky. But we must think of alternatives. We now know that we didn't know 50 years ago, didn't know 500 years ago. If we wait 50 years to change course, huh, there won't be 500 years to reflect back, perhaps, on the opportunity that we have in our grasp now. Imagine that only in our time on our watch has Earth looked like this from afar burning through the deep assets to propel us into a more prosperous future if we get it together. We couldn't know about the capacity to accelerate the melting of ice. Of course, it's happened in the past. It will happen in the future with us or without us. But with us, 
we can measure what we are doing. Just a report that I read today about how the past summer has been the greatest time of melting of ice in the Arctic so far in our history. A, a water a melting of the ice larger than the United States. Well, that's kind of bad news for creatures who live in the Arctic, who depend on that ice cover. Bad news, too, for us. Huh. Think Katrina. Dare I say, think Sandy. Think of the consequences of heightened power in storms, of unpredictable weather, about predictably increased temperature, but the destabilization of systems that give us things that we have taken for granted, certainly during my lifetime. It never occurred to me as a kid going to the Florida Keys and to other coral reefs around the world that I would live to see the loss of more than half of the coral reefs or the serious decline of, in some cases, as much as 80% of the coral reef cover. And it's accelerating. They may be gone by the middle of this century based on some calculations. Why? Well, climate change is one factor. But the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere driving acidification of the ocean is another. The bleaching of coral driven by warming seas is one thing. Our appetite for creatures who live in coral reefs, the fish, is another factor that we're just beginning to take into account. But it isn't just the big things, it's the little things. Maybe most importantly, the microbes, because they respond quickly, most quickly, to changes in chemistry. They're also the creatures that are most important in terms of generating oxygen, taking up carbon, driving the chemistry of Earth itself. We're just beginning to realize our capacity to alter the nature of nature through what we put into the atmosphere, what we put into the sea, whether it's something that you can't really see, like acidification of the ocean, like carbon dioxide in the air, in the ocean itself, or the big things like the plastics that have come along. I come from the pre-plasticozoic era. I, many of you have too. So humans can get along without it. I choose not to. I love plastics. It's what we do with them when we're through with them. We're thinking about a full life cycle, not just of plastics, but the many things that we construct and then just throw away to the great trauma of much of life on Earth that we haven't thought about before. We didn't think we had to. But now we know that what we put into places that we think of as a way come back to haunt us, haunt the creatures who have to live with the inheritance that go in, into the ocean, these colorful things that look like food that albatrosses feed to their chicks, and then the chicks never get to be grown-up albatrosses or go to the other end of the world, to Antarctica, where certainly we're seeing the effects of a warming planet. But it's also a place that is most unlikely place for humans to appear as major predators on ecosystems. 50 years ago, it wasn't a factor in the life and times of creatures there at all. We couldn't easily get to Antarctica half a century ago. But now fleets of ships are going to Antarctica to take the food out of the mouths of penguins, <laughs> seals, sea lions, whales, the whole lot. Krill, one of the most abundant creatures on Earth, but critically important because they affect the food chains, the chemistry of the southern oceans. And there we are, extracting them, millions of tons of krill, of deep sea ice fish. Some of them take 30 years to mature maybe a hundred years, like this little orange roughy that appears in my local supermarket for $8.99 a pound, but they may live to be two centuries. Wouldn't you like to know how to live to be two centuries old and be healthy and still reproducing as these little fish have somehow mastered the fine art of doing that? There are secrets that they have that might be far more valuable to us than how they taste on a plate. So far, we've been fairly crude in our appreciation of most wildlife in the sea, thinking of them mainly as sources of 
protein, orange roughy, there you see them. They're actually rather small fish, considering their great age, but look at all the other things that are caught in the process of taking them. A bulldozer approach to taking wildlife from the sea. Tunas have become so regular on menus around the world that the very thought that you might have to stop eating tuna is appalling to many. What? My sushi? Protect my sushi. <laughs> but if we aren't careful, there won't be any tuna for sushi going into the next century or even the middle of this century. When I served as the chief scientist of NOAA, a little piece of paper came across my desk saying that 90% of the blue fins in the North Atlantic were already gone. Shouldn't we do something about that, I asked. I mean, are we trying to exterminate them? Because if we are, we're doing a great job. We only have 10% left to go. Well, of course we don't want to exterminate them. They're valuable to us as a luxury item in our diet. But they're far more valuable to us swimming in the sea as a part of those great ocean food chains that shape the chemistry of the planet that is our only home. Sharks used to be thought of as bad creatures, the only good shark, a dead shark. But now we know, if we, we're close to getting our wish, no more sharks in the sea, maybe 90% of them are gone. They've been around for 300 million years. And on our watch, our capacity to take them for a luxury item, a macho meal, a shark steak or shark fin soup. You know, we used to do it with whales before we understood the real value of whales. Now, there are whales still being taken for food, for oil, but by and large, we've taken a different direction. We can change. We have that capacity, but it starts with knowing that there are values that transcend wildlife, natural systems as commodities. We're beginning to get it. We're beginning to look with new eyes at the economic value of nature. The Economist had a big conference in Singapore just last February, calling on nations of the world to look at the underlying economy, those hidden values that we are beginning to put on the balance sheet, like, do you like to breathe? Do you like water that falls out of the sky? Do you like a planet that works in your favor? I mean, these are questions that for the first time are beginning to be seriously asked at the Rio Plus 20 conference in the past June in Brazil. Nations being, for the first time, really seriously considering their blue backyards. There's another whole United States out there. It's the blue part, out 200 miles. Small island nations are actually big ocean nations, like those in the Pacific, like Bermuda, looking around and saying, oh, we have a chance to get it right as we use the new technologies, the new insight about the value of the planet to us. New value for things like mangroves. About half of them are already gone because people love the coast. They get rid of the trees so they can put hotels right on the beach. But now, with increasing storms, with a loss of shores, the Gulf of Mexico, the Philippines, throughout the world, wherever mangroves live, they're beginning to look be viewed with new values because they generate oxygen, they grab carbon. It turns out that they have a capacity to grab and hold about 50 times the amount, up to as much as 50 times the amount of carbon as trees in a forest on the land because they have these roots that hold the carbon and into the sediments below. Good news, we're restoring mangroves. This is a picture in China where they are getting it. They understand the value of marshes, of seagrass meadows. Wouldn't it be great if New York still had its vast oyster beds of the 17 and 18 and early 1900s, but they're basically gone. It's like a great insurance policy out there, protection against storms, against high waves. It's true too with these seagrass meadows that hold the sediment, hold the bottom in place, as well as producing a lot of oxygen, taking up a lot of carbon. The whole idea of blue carbon is just beginning to be appreciated, whether it's the Sargasso Sea or the small creatures that live in the water itself. Good news, Hong Kong, throughout Asia,
kids. Bless the kids. They're beginning to understand. It's their future that's on the line. Well, it's ours too. They have a chance, we have a chance to take action, to do what these kids are pledging to do. Save the sharks, save the turtles, save the ocean, save ourselves. It is happening. This is that moment when, if you see kids with pro-chlorococcus t-shirts, you know that some good changes are taking place. This mighty microbe that generates one in every five breaths we take, whose existence was unknown until 1986. What else is out there? What else is down there? What else is in there? within the cells of our own bodies that we need to understand that we are just on the edge of this greatest era of exploration ever. So finally, this image. This is a bird I met last January, halfway across the Pacific, Midway Island. It's a Laysan albatross. It's a girl. Her name is Wisdom. She's been named by those who have come to know her over the last 61 years. She's sitting on her most recent egg. We know how old she is because she was banded early in her life. She was actually learning to fly at about the same time that I was learning to dive. <laughs> and at about the same time that she chose, or there was a mutual understanding, between two Laysan albatrosses, of course, wisdom, in her wisdom, and her mate. It takes about 10 to 14 years for this process to occur before they decide to pair up for life. It was at about that time, perhaps, that Joan Stites was first peering into microscopes and trying to figure out what goes on in the depths of cells. Well, here we are. Think of what has happened in the last six decades. Half the albatrosses are female. I don't have to point that out. <laughs> Half the fish are female, too. And they do the heavy lifting right along with their pals. And it's time, of course, in celebrating this evening's honoree and the concept that goes under, underlies that, to celebrate what women do with their male counterparts. Over the last 100,000 years, to imagine what will the next 100,000 be, and to reflect on this. This point in history, this pivotal point in time, will determine probably more than any other time in history because as never before we know what we know, as never again will there be a better time to act on that knowledge, whether it's on a planetary scale, the health of the planet, or right down to our individual selves and human health. I just want to salute those of you who have gathered this evening for all that you're doing, all that has been done to bring together this special occasion, and to thank you for your vision Thank you for making the world a better place. Well, thank you very much, Sylvia, for that visionary and inspiring presentation. Uh, I'd now like to uh, introduce and welcome Joan Stites, our honoree this evening. Uh, like Sylvia, Dr. Stites is also very much an explorer um, who has blazed a trail to discovery that many uh, others have joined. The scientific path she chose was the study of ribonucleic acid, uh, better known as RNA. When Joan began her doctoral studies, RNA biology was poorly understood 
Her decision to delve into the mysteries of RNA was one of sev several bold moves in a career that began appropriately during a decade of revolutionary changes, the 1960s. In uh, 1963, Joan was the only woman to enroll in Harvard University's new graduate program in biochemistry and molecular biology. She took this step with the encouragement of her mentor, uh, James Watson, who had recently shared the Nobel Prize with Francis Crick and Maurice Wilkins for unraveling the structure of DNA. In Jim Watson's lab, she began studying RNA in bacterial systems. Later, as a postdoctoral researcher in Cambridge, England, she continued to work on bacterial genetics. And in a stunning accomplishment, she pinpointed the sequences on messenger RNA that a molecular machine called the ribosome binds to uh, to produce proteins. Messenger RNA, of course, is the molecule that serves as a template for the synthesis of a protein. It's also a molecule that Joan would continue to encounter and redefine throughout her career. In 1970, she joined the faculty of Yale University. Her focus shifted from bacteria to the cells of higher organisms, and the study of RNA became more complex and even more interesting. At Yale, she made the fascinating and important discovery of so-called small nuclear ribonucleoproteins, also known as SNRPs. SNRPs perform a crucial function called splicing, which normally ensure, uh, ensures that a messenger RNA molecule contains only the sequences that are needed for the synthesis of a protein. Some of the RNA processing mechanisms that Dr. Stites discovered may help to explain how human beings have evolved to be highly complex, even with what seems like a paltry complement of just about 25,000 genes. In addition, her findings have expanded our understanding of a range of illnesses, uh, including cancers and autoimmune disorders, that arise from de defects in the processes that she's been studying. Research on small RNAs, uh, in fact, is transforming many disciplines in biology, and Dr. Stites is recognized as a pioneer in the field, and her lab at Yale continues to make critical contributions. Throughout the years, uh, Joan Stites has also worked to ensure that she will never again be the lone woman scientist in the laboratory. Uh, she has been a mentor to many women and men pursuing careers in biomedicine, and she's a tireless advocate for gender balance in the sciences. Her enthusiasm for her students has made her a respected and well-loved presence at Yale, where she is Sterling Professor of Molecular Biophysics and Biochemistry and an investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. I'm pleased to say that she's also deeply admired at this university. As many of you know, uh, this is not the first time Rockefeller has honored Dr. Stites this year. Uh, last June, she received an honorary degree, along with her colleague and friend, Professor Jim Darnell of Rockefeller University. And I'm pleased to say that Jim is here tonight to help us celebrate. Now, in a few minutes, um, I'll talk with uh, Joan about her amazing journey in science. But first, I'd please um, uh, like to ask you um, uh, to join me in welcoming her to the stage. Uh, Sylvia, will you also please join us? It's, it's my pleasure to read excerpts from the citation that's being presented to Dr. Stites this evening. You're being honored for your fundamental discoveries and profound insights in the field of RNA research, which have broadened our understanding of gene expression in higher organisms. In landmark investigations spanning nearly five decades, you've continued to elucidate the regulation and function of RNA, providing increasingly sophisticated interpretation of this essential molecule's role in cellular processes that contribute to health and disease. You've inspired us with your commitment to education and your far-sighted efforts to seek gender balance in the sciences. As a mentor and a leader, you've supported the careers of numerous men and women in science, helping to ensure that academic biomedical research will have many future champions. Sylvia? So, <clears throat> it is my honor to present to you, Joan Stites, the Perlmeister Green Guard Prize, an international award recognizing outstanding women in biomedical science. So on behalf of the D Distinguished Selection Committee of the Perlmeister Green Guard Prize and all of us here today, we congratulate you on this award. So.
Thank you very much, Sylvia. And now, Joan, uh, would you please have a seat with me on stage? So there are, of course, uh, many in the audience who are uh, at least somewhat unfamiliar with your research before tonight. And so perhaps you could start by explaining uh, what messenger RNA is, and then please say a word about both your, your research uh, on uh, mRNA and also more recent discoveries about its control. So. In the introductory remarks, many of these things were already said, but I will say them again. Uh, in thinking about RNA, we have to go back to DNA. And I think you all know that DNA is this gorgeous double-stranded structure that was discovered by Watson and Crick in 1953. You all know that the information in our genes is coded by the sequence of bases in this beautiful double-stranded molecule, and that when a cell divides, the DNA comes apart, serves as a template for synthesizing additional strands by the base pairing rules, and then we end up with two daughter cells that have the same information. So now we come to RNA. For the information to get out of a gene, we need to first make RNA which is a copy of one of the strands of DNA. Messenger RNA was discovered way back in 1961. And in the many years since then, or the many years between 1953 and about 1975 or six or seven, um, much was learned about messenger RNA and how it is made, how that's regulated, and then how it is acted on by these cellular machines called ribosomes in order to make proteins. What was amazing, and I think shocked the whole molecular biology world, was the discovery in 1977 that our DNA, unlike the DNA in the bacteria that were, had been so fervently studied up until that time, the information was interrupted by segments of nonsense. In other words, the genes were sort of a mosaic where there would be pieces of sense and then pieces of nonsense. And moreover, the whole sequence would be made into R, copied into RNA. So what that meant was that there also had to be a cellular machinery that would somehow recognize the junctions between the nonsense and the sense and put it back together to create messenger RNAs that could be translated by the ribosome to make proteins that do all the work in the cells. And what my lab did, thanks to a lot of serendipity, was to figure out what the building blocks of this machine are that splices out the nonsense from the messenger RNA in order to make it readable in a process that's called RNA splicing. And these building blocks turned out to be these things called SNRPs that you've already heard about, which are little particles that have RNA in them and protein in them. And they're the ones that recognize the junctions and assemble this machine called the spliceosome that in fact then removes the introns, throws them away, the introns being the nonsense, throws them away, and then splices back together the good parts of the message. It's like you know, pruning a tree. You cut out the dead wood and put back together the good parts. So what's happened since then is that there have been many other kinds of regulatory RNA molecules that have been discovered some in our labs, some in other labs. For instance, there are regulatory RNAs that help make ribosomes uh, by modifying them in such a way that they can do their job better. Uh, there's an RNA molecule that was discovered in Gunter Blobel's lab that's important for taking proteins that are made inside a cell that need to get outside the cell and um, carrying out that particular process. It turns out there's not just one kind of spliceosome in our cells. There's a whole different set of SNRPs that assemble into a different kind of spliceosome to 
cut out different kinds of nonsense. Um, and recently, we've had a further revolution in understanding that there are many little tiny RNAs. The ones I've been talking about are like 100 to 200 long. They're little tiny RNAs, about 20 long, that are responsible for actually controlling how the messenger RNA gets translated. And these have turned out to be important in development, in disease, in all aspects of the biology of what's going on in the cells of our bodies. So that's sort of a panorama starting with messenger RNA and going up to current time. So, so it's, it's very much like what Sylvia said earlier, just as she and others were learning about new, entirely new species of marine organisms by delving deeper and deeper we've discovered many new species of RNAs and small RNAs and learn, we've been learning about their functions in the cell. Exactly. You, you mentioned disease. I know many of the people here are interested in um, not just the normal functioning of the body, but what mm -hmm. can go wrong. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what can go wrong in the processes that you've studied yeah. uh, that can give rise to diseases? So it turns out that about 20% of genetically inherited diseases actually involve making mistakes in the splicing process because something in the machinery is damaged or the messenger RNA is mutated. Um, some of the first diseases to be connected to splicing were thalassemias where faulty hemoglobins are made. Hemoglobin carries oxygen in our red blood cells. But one disease that I want to mention because I'm very excited about what the prospects are for therapies at the moment is a disease called spinal muscular atrophy, or SMA. Uh, this turns out to be the most common genetic cause of childhood mortality worldwide. And it's a disease in which there's degeneration of certain cells in the spinal cord, and as a result, the muscles become paralyzed or atrophy and either, depending on the severity of the disease, the patients either die very, very young or end up in a wheelchair for life, a very, very tragic situation. It turns out that the gene that's affected in this disease, a disease or a gene called SMN, is actually part of a protein machine that assembles SNRPs. So what goes wrong in people that have this disease is that their SNRPs aren't assembled properly, and as a result, the whole splicing process doesn't occur quite like it should. Um, and there are lots of things that go wrong with it in many different tissues, and for reasons we don't understand, these spinal cord cells are the ones that are most highly affected. But what's exciting about what's happened with this particular disease. It in fact turns out that we have two genes for this particular protein, and people with the disease have lost one of those genes, which is the good gene. The other gene, which is only has five base changes with the good gene, doesn't get spliced properly. And that's why it doesn't, can't take over when the good gene is mutated. But what's happened recently is a number of investigators, and here Adrian Craner at the Cold Spring Harbor Lab is, is a leader in this, have developed little RNA molecules that can be put into cells and change the splicing pattern of the bad gene that doesn't normally produce the protein that helps SNRPs assemble. And they've had success with a mouse model where the mice, instead of dying at 15 days of age, live a normal span and have all the motor functions. And these oligonucleotides are just now going into clinical trials in humans. And it would be wonderful if our understanding of the splicing apparatus, the assembly of SNRPs, what can go wrong with it, could contribute to therapy for this devastating disease. That's a, it's a very exciting time. Yeah. As these molecules, in yeah. fact, several. And that's only, gone only one clinic. particular yeah. example that's related to an RNA disease. Tell us a little about, bit about the, the journey of discovery, maybe thinking back to your own career when you started in Jim Watson's lab. Yeah. Um, when you set out uh, in your studies, uh, how much did you follow your own intuition about where you want to go? How much was the, 
was it the, the culture of the lab or the problems that were being debated that influenced you? What, what led you to yeah. take the path that you took? Okay, so as Sylvia emphasized in her very powerful and inspirational talk, uh, things were different at the time I was a graduate student. It was the beginnings of this new field of molecular biology. People had come into this field from many different fields, and they all wanted to understand the molecular basis of life, how cells really worked. And it was believed at that time that you'd never be able to figure out anything unless you start very simple. So everybody worked on bacteria and the viruses that infect bacteria because they were very simple. And I confess that I sort of subscribe to this sort of bacterial-centric view of molecular biology, certainly when I was a student, also when I was a postdoc, and for the first 10 years or so of being a faculty member, we worked on RNA from bacteria. But what started happening in the 1970s, just before the discovery of introns and then eventually splicing, um, was that it was apparent that there were bizarre things that were going on in our cells compared to these bacterial cells that we thought we understood pretty well. One was there, that there was way too much DNA, and part of that we now know are these nonsense segments, these introns. Um, but the other thing, and I think this, a lot of this work came out of Jim Darnell's lab here at Rockefeller, was the finding that in our cells, much of the RNA that's made gets degraded, and only a small fraction, maybe 10% or so of it, actually makes it into messenger RNAs that can be translated. And I was fascinated and decided that it was time for me to move, as so many other investigators were, from studying bacteria to studying higher cells. And in a sabbatical, I tried to do some experiments, which ended up failing, um, in order to um, study this process by making antibodies against the proteins that bound the RNA. Um, and it was at that time, actually, that somebody mentioned to me that there might be patients with autoantibodies against these particular proteins that made us aware later when I got back to my lab after the sabbatical project had failed, made me alert to reports in the literature of autoantibodies. And it then turned out that these patients uh, that had been investigated mostly here at the Rockefeller by Henry <coughs> Kunkel, um, and what he knew about the targets of these antibodies turned out to be really valuable tools for us in studying SNRPs. So you, you followed one clue after another, but also keeping your eyes open to developments in other fields and, and things yeah. that seemed Very not to quite make sense. Yes, yes. You, know. uh, you mentioned failure. Um, what, uh, tell us a little about your attitude towards failure and, and any advice you have to young scientists in the audience. Uh, actually, this question was asked this afternoon in my very, very much fun meeting with a group of uh, graduate, uh, postdoctoral, and faculty women. I think my answer has to be that if you've been in the field for a long time, you know that things go up and down. And when things aren't looking good, you've been there before, and you realize that things will probably turn around. Now, this is not helpful for a young person. And one of the who hasn't yet seen this cycle. Uh, one of the things that uh, is the hardest thing in science, I think, is deciding when you're working on something that's just premature and it's too early to get an answer as opposed to something where if you just work a little bit harder, you will in fact be able to figure out what's going on. And there have been several instances in my career when doing one last experiment opened up everything. And I, it's very difficult for me to say what the intuition is there that says you've got to do that last experiment. So I know this isn't very helpful advice, but that's what I have to say. So that's the, the art of science. That's the art of science, that's indeed. 
Now, as you know, uh, turning to another topic, uh, Yale recently released a study that found that there's still a great many pervasive barriers uh, to women achieving success uh, in higher levels of academia. Um, it's noticeable that in your own lab, you've had uh, many highly successful women scientists. You've, you've helped launch their careers. And I wonder if I could ask you two questions. First, um, if you could tell us about your own approach in your own lab uh, to mentoring young women. And then um, uh, advice more generally um, to the scientific community um, and to science as a discipline about how it uh, can and should um, correct the problem of gender imbalance. Okay, I think I want to do that a little bit maybe in the opposite order. Okay. But for those of you who don't know, um, the paper you were referring to uh, is a paper by Joe Handelsman that was recently published in PNAS. And it was one of these studies where an identical CV was sent out to a number of people, in this case, as faculty members in biology, physics, and chemistry, with either the name Jennifer somebody or the name John somebody at the top of the paper, at the top of the CV. And the recipients were then asked how promising they thought this person was. It was done in the context of an application to be a lab manager, what they thought the person ought to get paid, and whether or not they thought the person was, should, should, was a good candidate for mentoring. And what they received back, whether they came from women or from men faculty, was that the CVs with the name Jennifer at the top, the person was rated less highly, the pay that the person might be given was lower, and the person was rated as a less promising candidate for mentoring. So why I think this was a shock to people in science was that we've liked to think of ourselves as objective, data-driven, thinking beings. We knew about these studies when the questionnaires were sent to people in other fields and thought, oh, it wouldn't be the same if it were sent to scientists. But looking at that makes us realize that we all, men and women alike, have unconscious bias. And that is the problem with dealing with mentoring young women. And I've had about 50% men and women in my lab. Part of the reason for that is that I like diversity. And then subsequent studies have shown that if you have more diverse groups of people uh, trying to tackle a difficult problem, they come up with more creative solutions to the problem than very monolithic groups of people. But to go back to the, the problem of implicit bias, what happens with young women is that little things pile up. People make comments. They lose confidence in their own ability and start questioning their own uh, ability to go forward and, and have a successful career. And that's the hardest thing to know what to do about that and how to advise them. Another thing that we discussed quite fruitfully this afternoon was the fact that women tend to think much harder about the distant future and worry about what might happen in 10 years' time and 20 years' time, and therefore become discouraged about whether they can actually do it. I think the only solution is talking about these things. Um, I think the uh, results of the Handelsman report will be looked at by many scientists, and it's nobody's fault that we're all affected by these implicit biases. It's just there. But there are ways of trying to counteract these in hiring practices that could increase the representation of women in universities. There, there are tricks and devices that have been devised by, um, by the cognitive psychologists and sociologists. And I think as more and more of those mechanisms are applied, that things will continue to level out and there'll be opportunity for women equally with men to make discoveries and engage in the joy of science. 
Well, I think we, we should open the, the discussion up to the audience now and, and take uh, any questions. I think we have some roving microphones. Professor Stite, uh, your department at Yale is uh, uh, molecular biophysics and biochemistry. As you know, uh, biophysics has gone to the nano level. Uh, what do you foresee as the future in that respect? Uh, I, I noticed because my son majored in that <laughs> when he was an uh, undergraduate at Yale with your department. So what do you uh, foresee at that level of research and, and the prospects of curing disease at that level? And as you know, uh, in radiation oncology, uh, knowledge of uh, 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 molecular biophysics is also necessary, or even nuclear particle physics. So I just wondered, how do you translate from the RNA to the nano levels? I think I'm going to sidestep your very elegant question um, and a very meaningful question by saying that I personally have never been very good at predicting what was going to happen in the future. And I want to illustrate that with one uh, incident. Sometime in the 1990s, I was writing a grant renewal. And at that time, we've been talking about these new kinds of RNAs. And I almost wrote into my grant proposal that by the time I retired, I wanted to know the function of every non-coding regulatory RNA inside a mammalian cell. And I mentioned this to my husband, who's sitting here in the front row, who is very wise. And he said, don't be foolish. You don't know what's going to happen. And indeed, that was before the discovery of microRNAs, before the non-coding RNA revolution that we're now experiencing. So what I have to say to answer your question is this is a new frontier. Uh, clearly, the background that your son has learned is relevant in one way because it teaches him the basics, but it's irrelevant in terms probably of what he will be doing because he will be confronting completely new problems and trying to find solutions using tools that we don't even know about today. So there's vast potential. Thank you. Joan, I'm wondering, with your close relationship with Jim Watson, if you might comment on his colleague, Rosalind Franklin. <laughs> well, Rosalind Franklin was clearly a remarkable woman. And I think I have devoured every biography of her that I've been able to lay my hands on. The way she has been viewed. Uh, at various times in history is quite different. I think Jim Watson views her differently now from the picture that is portrayed in his book, The Double Helix. And it's clear that she's made absolutely remarkable contributions. And what's so tragic is that she did not live longer in order to actually receive the recognition that I think she would have received had she lived longer. Yeah. How your research um, sort of uh, got into autoimmune disease and the study of lupus, what spurred you on that direction? OK. So as, as I mentioned earlier, I was fascinated by the problem before the discovery of introns that there was all this RNA turning over in the nucleus and not becoming the messenger RNA. And I tried to make antibodies against proteins that bind RNA, and unsuccessfully, for reasons I could go into, but that are very specialized. And it was during that time that somebody mentioned to us, or to me, that they thought they had heard of patients that made antibodies against their own cellular components, autoantibodies that were directed against something that had RNA and protein in it. And I simply filed that away. And then a year later, when I was back in my own lab, there appeared a paper in Nature that talked about these antibodies. 
And I said to uh, a starting MD-PhD student who was in my lab, I said, do you know of anybody here at Yale who is a rheumatologist, which is what we're talking about, who might have patients that would have these particular uh, types of autoantibodies, and he said, sure, I'll go over and see Hardin, who was in the rheumatology section right across the street from me at Yale Medical School. And he went over and that very afternoon came back with vials of blood from patients that, that had lupus and related autoimmune diseases, and we started trying to figure out what they were targeting. We made a lot of... Um, detours by going down wrong alleys before more serendipity helped us to figure out how to really do the experiment. And then we were able to realize that what these antibodies were directed against were the SNRPs that are part of the splicing apparatus that removed the introns from the RNA. Thank you. A question here? Many of us here are your admirers as a scientist, but I think we're also your admirers as a person that when you started, you know, the, the system was much more difficult for you at the time that you were coming in. And you alluded to the Handelsman Report and what's still left, but I think things have improved in our lives. And I guess, looking at you as a person, how would you say, what would you say is the most important way that you found not to be discouraged when people were undermining you, or not to be angry when you thought you were treated unfairly, that enabled you to be the scientist you were without that standing in your way? I think all women scientists who are very successful think that they have somehow been exceptions to many of the disappointments and many of the uh, negative things that come, can come at women. Um, there are, in fact, several times in my life when I know that being a woman and being discriminated against, in fact, turned out to be something very, very good. One example was when I was at the end of my first year of graduate school, I went along to a very prominent cell biologist and asked whether I could work in his lab. He ended up telling me I was a woman and I would have children and, you know, what, what good was it to train me? And I made it out of his office before I burst into tears. And I went along to my second choice thesis advisor, who was Jim Watson. <laughs> and being in Jim Watson's lab was clearly one of the best things that ever happened to me. Uh, another time that I can talk about was when my husband, Tom, uh, had a job at Berkeley. We went there after our postdoc briefly. Uh, and when we inquired about whether there might be a job for me there, we were told, well, women like to be research associates. They don't want to be professors. And we had offers in hand from Yale and Princeton, and we decided to go to Yale, which was clearly a very, very, very good thing. So those are a couple instances where if you take those occurrences, and try to use them in particular ways. They turn out to be good. So I guess my advice is that um, I'm not saying it's not hard, and I'm not saying that there aren't slights, and I'm not saying that there aren't times when it's difficult to cope. But if you try to have a very positive attitude, and what everybody in science has to have is a joy in doing science, a joy in the discovery, that this will propel you forward and allow you to make it through. I think we have time for just one last question. Yes, sir. Oh, yes Sylvia. Yes, please. Yeah. Get the final word. There are a thousand questions I want to ask, but <laughs> there's just one I'm truly curious about, and that is there are a lot of cells in our body that aren't our cells. I mean, there are all those all bacteria. bacteria. Yeah. And I'd just love to hear your thoughts on their contribution to who we are. Uh, <laughs> well, again, this isn't my own work. This is uh, Joe Handelsman, <laughs> who also works in this particular area. And what's been discovered there recently is absolutely amazing. 
the extent to which we are dependent upon these billions of bacterial cells in terms of providing us with differences in the way we digest our food, differences in the way we interact with our environment. Uh, so it's clear, just like your deep sea vents, where there are all these creatures that are dependent upon one another, we have evolved to be very, very dependent upon all of these bacteria that, that uh, invade us. But they're good invaders in that they allow us to do lots of things we wouldn't be able to do without their presence. So, as you pointed out, what's been so remarkable about the last 50 years when I've been fortunate to be in science is how much has been discovered. And now we're working on thinking about things we weren't thinking about before. And I sincerely hope that we will get our act together in the area you're concerned about so that there will continue to be opportunities to discover more things in the future. Well, Joan? You'd I like haven't, to say I have, I, when am I going to be allowed to say thank you? <laughs> uh, well, now would be a good time. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. So first I have to thank the selection committee. Uh, I want to thank Sylvia for a really inspiring talk. And mostly I want to say something to Paul and Ursula about this prize. I think prizes in science are important because they highlight what's going on in science that advances are being made. Prizes to women in science tell young women that it's possible for women also to do science. And I see Sarah Lee Shook sitting here. Um, her Weitzman Women in Science Prize was the first prize for women in science that I ever received. And it was very, very meaningful. And I think what you, Paul, and Ursula have done in terms of this prize has been really, really incredible because it says something to the community about the fact that everyone can contribute to science. Well, I think we want to thank you as well, Joan, and congratulate you. I'd also like to thank Sylvia Earle for her contribution tonight. Thank you, Sylvia. <laughs> <laughs>